There are literally thousands of index tracker funds to choose from. So how can you possibly know which one to invest in? Watch this video for the key considerations to help you choose the index funds for your portfolio. Hi there, welcome to my channel where we talk money and having more of it. In this video, we are going to set up a simple checklist for choosing your index tracker funds. As a starting point, an index tracker fund is a fund that replicates or simply copies a market index. And a market index is a subset of assets in an entire market. For example, the FTSE 100 is an index of the 100 largest companies in the UK as measured by their market capitalization. And a market capitalization is simply their share price times the amount of shares they have outstanding. As I mentioned in the intro, there are literally thousands of these tracker funds to choose from. So where do you start? Well, here's a quick investing checklist to narrow down the options. The first item on the checklist is knowing what index is being tracked. When analyzing the world of index trackers, it's good to have a strategy around what you want to put in your portfolio. In my video on how to build an easy beginner portfolio, I describe a simple approach to creating your portfolio and discuss the type of tracker funds you would want to put in that portfolio. So by narrowing down the starting point to how you want your portfolio to look, you will have a smaller universe of funds to choose from. In the UK, the most well-known tracker, tracker funds will be the FTSE 100, which I mentioned earlier, holds the 100 largest companies in the UK, which make about 80% of the UK stock market. And the UK All Share Index, which holds about 600 companies and makes out about 98% of the stock market. In the US, the S&P 500 would be the most tracked index. There are indexes covering literally every corner of the globe, and you could conceivably, at a very high cost, own every one of these indexes. Or quite simply, you could own one global index tracker to give you exposure to different geographies. The second item on our checklist is understanding the fund's tracking error. An index tracker attempts to match the performance of a particular index of stocks. In other words, it attempts to follow the ups and downs of that index as closely as possible. And it does that by exposing itself to the performance of the underlying stocks in that index. But how does it do this? There are two ways in which a tracker fund can track an index. The first one is full replication, and the second one is statistical sampling. Now, full replication means exactly that, creating a portfolio that includes every single stock in that index at its relevant weight. Now, the main advantage of this approach to replication is that you can expect that the index tracker will match the index as closely as possible. A huge disadvantage of this approach is that it can be very expensive and it's totally impractical for large indexes. So statistical sampling works for these larger indexes, such as the S&P 500, where full replication cannot be achieved at an efficient or cost-effective method. And so to track these larger indexes, statistical sampling selects not every single share or stock in that index, but a sample of stocks that should represent that index as closely as possible. Tracking error arises from this, the various replication methods. And it is really the difference between the return of the fund's benchmark, the index that we're trying to track, and the fund itself. And because you are invested in that index tracker fund to get the same return as the index, you wanted to do so. So a big tracking error would represent a poorly replicated index and be a red flag. You can see the fund's tracking error on the fund fact sheet and it's generally under the risk stats. And for an index tracker fund, you'd want this tracking error to be as low as possible. The third item on our checklist is what the fund charges. And in this respect, the lower the better. The fund charges can also be found on the fund fact sheet. Most tracker funds have no initial or exit charge. So the only cost we need to think about is the fund's annual charge. Now it's best to look at the 
ongoing charge figure, which is called the OCF, and it's sometimes also referred to as the total expense ratio, the TER. And this is just a standardized industry term, meaning all the annual charges levied by the fund. And so this makes them comparable between funds. For a tracker fund that invests solely in the UK companies, you would expect a fund charge of at most 0.2%. Trackers that follow the US market are also relatively cheap, whereas you'll find that European or Asian trackers and those that follow a specific country or other sector will probably cost a bit more. They are index tracking funds that track global markets, and this is a very cheap way of holding the widest number of companies across various geographies. A further cost that's not that important, but that may pop up now and then is a dilution levy. This is charged because during periods where there's a lot of buying and selling within a fund, it increases the fund's dealing costs, and this can impact the value of the fund. And as a result, some funds charge this dilution levy of between 0.5 and 1% and save the value in the fund to cushion these dealing charges. Only a small number of funds have this charge levied. Some funds only apply the dilution levy when there's a lot of trading going on in the market. The majority of funds, however, allow these charges to be absorbed into their annual cost. The last item on the checklist is what type of fund you are looking for. A single fund tracking a particular index may issue various different classes of shares. And these different classes may even trade at different prices depending on their objectives. For example, some funds may be targeted at retail investors like you and I, and others at institutional investors like pension funds. Another difference is that some funds are defined as income funds and others as accumulation funds. And this basically determines how any income derived from their funds underlying assets is treated. This means, for example, in the case of the FTSE 100 index track, there will be companies within that FTSE 100 that pay dividends. And the fund's definition will decide how you are paid that amount. With income funds, income is paid out to fund holders as cash, and this could provide the investor with an income stream, or alternatively, they could reinvest into additional units. With accumulation funds, income is retained within the fund and reinvested, increasing the price of the units. Generally, for investors who don't want income right now and would prefer to reinvest and grow that way, through, grow their fund that way, an accumulation fund would be more cost effective and convenient to do so. This simple four step process can narrow down your analysis. The last step, which is really outside the checklist, is to understand the performance of the fund over the last five to 10 years. But bear in mind, it's tracking a subset of the market and should theoretically perform exactly as that subset does. So the consideration here is how risky is this fund that you are getting into and this, does this risk match your risk tolerance. And this is also found in the fund fact sheet, which will show that the risk of the fund out of seven, so the higher that number, the riskier the fund is. But obviously the higher the risk, the higher the potential reward and you'd need to consider how to balance this. If you are ready to get started investing but want more information, pop down to the notes below and grab the Investing 101 guide. If you like this video, let me know by hitting like and please share it with any other ladies who want to change your financial story. For financial education and money talk designed for women, subscribe to my channel and hit the bell to be notified of when I post a new video. It's been great speaking to you today.